All right, so what we're doing right here is we're going to have these things clickable. The front door is the one that is not the right way to go, but what we want is a little bit of feedback. Uh, I'm going to make it that like the door wiggles or something or, or that that, you know, the handle wiggles, whatever, however you want to animate this. But it's going to be the same sort of idea like when we were back over here on the gate. Well, the gate has some built in animation that doesn't play until you click on the thing. So this front door will have its own built in animation that doesn't play until we click on it. The difference will be that when you click on that, it won't have the go to and play. The go to and play doesn't happen until we break the window. So we're going to need to then be able to move the rock. And when that rock touches that window, it detects it. And then it does go to and play to the hallway. So let's set up our, uh, our false lead of the door. If you double click the door, we're going to be editing the, the timeline of the door. And here, whatever sort of like uh, animation or fun thing you want to do. Question there, guys? No, no, I'm just saying I have questions concerning my input. Okay. It's not really concerning the okay. Okay, we'll focus on that in a moment. What I want to do here is go over to frame. I'm going to draw a little bit of like movement or wiggling. I'm going to go to frame 3, F6. And maybe what I'll do is maybe I'll use the free transform to sort of like uh, make it make it slightly bigger like that. So on one frame it looks like this, another frame it moves like that. And then jump over a few more frames, F6, and then maybe make it slightly smaller like this. So when it plays, the illusion is something like that. So that it kind of like jumps a little bit. So the idea is first frame, normal. Second frame, slightly larger. Third frame, a little bit smaller than the starting point size. There's the starting point. When it plays, it does a sort of like a little jump. And it's going to loop. I'm just playing it as it's looping. It's not really going to loop like that because we're going to have a stop command. Um, and I'm showing here to to just change a little bit and then maybe even rotate it slightly like that. So all of this is going to happen really fast in like, you know, seven frames. And when it all happens that fast, the the person playing gets this sense of that there's some movement, that there's something going on with that. So just to zoom in here. On one frame, it's normal. For the next frame, changed a little bit. The next frame, changed a little bit. And the last frame, I also rotated it. I could draw it in terms of, maybe I'll just draw, I'll animate the, the door knob. Maybe on those frames that I drew there, the only thing that I change is the doorknob. I have it rotate a little bit to the right. And then next frame, have it rotate a little to the left. And then the next frame, have it rotate some more. So when it actually plays, it looks like, it looks like a rotation. Someone trying to grab it and rotate it. All of that is this illusion of animation, this movement. But in order for it not to automatically wiggle, I need an actions layer with a stop command. So we've got the actual layer one with a little bit of animation happening. Actions layer with a stop command. That's exactly the same idea as, as that front door, so that it doesn't slam open and close, open and close. 
we have the stop command. Alright, so in order for this interactivity to actually happen, I'll go back to the main scene. I'll confirm that that front door has an instance name, front door MC. I'll go to the actions layer of the actual scene, and again to confirm here on the left, I'm on scene door one, I'm not inside the movie clip of door. front door MC, so we're going to create another event listener. Um, whatever the name of your door is, mine is front door MC, add event listener. Touch event dot touch tap. And front door wiggle. So this is a function that when you when you touch that front door, the only thing it'll really do is wiggle. It won't go anywhere. These other ones, um, we were calling them, you know, something like FN go scene one. Because the point of what it was doing was that it was going somewhere. When you tap that object, it goes somewhere. This one doesn't really go anywhere. I could call it, you know, FN front door go. I call it whatever you want. But here, conceptually, what it does is it's just going to wiggle. It's not going to do anything. So that's as good a name as any. And this is my note that this is the end of front door wiggle function. And all that this needs to do is front door movie clip play. Play the animation that we created inside the symbol. Every time you tap the door, play the animation of that symbol. It'll play those five frames. It'll get to the sixth frame and loop back to frame one, where the stop command is. So there's only one loop of wiggling. Um, and every time I tap that front door, it'll wiggle again, because it'll play again. It'll go from frame one to five. It'll want to go to frame six, and it loops back to frame one, where the stop command is at. So you can try testing that.
Forget what? All right, so let me debug that and see what that looks like. So let me check mine right here. I've got welcome. I go to play, see the front door, tap that, opens. Then it goes here to that front door. I tap it. Mismatch. Oops, that's the thing that we forget here. See, I forget it too sometimes. Uh, where it says expected zero got one. Okay, that's easy to fix. I just forgot to do this. The usual, this is empty. Right, those parentheses. It's not supposed to be empty, it's supposed to be event, colon, touch event. So that'll be an error because um, it's not a very good error. It kind of seems the opposite. It says expecting zero arguments and, and got one instead. Well, actually, there were zero, and it needs to be one. So um, inside the parentheses of door wiggle, event, colon, touch event. So it's supposed to have that, uh, that part in the parentheses. So let me try that one more time. I do play, I go past the gate, I go to the front door, I tap it, and then there's a little wiggle action. There we go. Eventually I'll have a sound effect there also, but for the moment I just see some feedback that when I tap that door, it moves a little bit, like it's rattling. However, I want to animate it, maybe just the door, um, the doorknob moving. But now every time I tap it, I get this little animation about it moving. Perfect. Okay, so the true way to get past this screen is not just simply to tap on the front door, let me in. Now we're adding a new layer, level of complexity to the game in that what about if you pick up an object to hit another object? Question. Yeah, let me finish my thought here and then I'll, I'll help you there. So now what we need to do here is um, get this object, this rock, and hit this window. So logically, I'm picking up a rock to throw it through a window. Programmatically, this is hit detection. One object, we're going to test if this object has intersected or touched another object. Did I put this object next to or on top of this object? Right now we've got objects separately on, in their own areas. But I want to detect, um, did this object touch that object? Well, first we need to be able to pick up the object and move it on top of the other object. I want to pick up the rock to move it on top of the window. I want to pick up the rock to throw it at the window. Then, when I tap it and drag it over, I have to let it go. I have to drop it. Then it's going to detect, did that object touch this object? If true, they did touch. Break the window, go to the next uh, scene. If they didn't touch, what if I picked it up and put it on the sidewalk instead of on the window? If this rock touched that window, true, go there. 
if this rock touched that window, false, don't go there. Play a sound, do something else. So this window is going to break and then move us to the next scene. So let's draw first a little bit of the window breaking. So we have some animation to play. Then we'll write the code to be able to move the rock onto the window if it detects a touch then play the break of the window, then move us to the next scene. So I'm going to double click that right window so I can draw the window breaking. Let's see how I'll do that. Maybe I'll start to draw first like some cracks in the glass. Six. Maybe start to oops, start to erase. Some of it. F six, draw a little bit more, or I mean erase a little bit more. and also draw some on the ground. So don't think just about, well, there's that object, that drawing. There's an environment. You can draw things elsewhere. So what I've got here, if I play quickly like that, or if I do it frame by frame, so I've got the window unbroken, then I've got a crack, then I've started to erase, I'll, I'll make it nicer later, but I've started to then erase parts of the drawing. I'll draw it better so that it looks like actual jagged, broken glass later. And then, um, you know, I can actually even also maybe draw pieces out over here. And then next frame. There's more of the break in the glass and more on the floor. And this is another instance where I want um, some amount of pause. So after I've drawn the final frame of it broken, I want to see that for a moment so that the user sees something happened. Uh, here, I just drew the part of it breaking, but no breathing room, no amount of time to, to soak it in, to take it in that the, uh, something actually happened. And I can go in and lovingly draw even more stuff happening, but we'll say this is this is enough. And this is something that takes about a second because glass breaks fast. so that this animation of the glass breaking doesn't play over and over and over. What does this symbol need? It needs a stop. It needs an actions layer with a stop command so that the animation doesn't play automatically over and over. So new layer on that. Actions. And then stop. So on, oops. So on frame one, before 
the glass breaks, I have a stop so that it doesn't animate. After we write the code to detect the rock touching the glass, we'll have a window write dot play. So then it'll it'll jump past the stop and it'll animate through, or it'll play through those frames. And at frame 25, we will have the the frame 24 will have um, a blank keyframe F7. Oops, um, here F7. Actually, we don't need that. We do that elsewhere. Okay, so we don't need that. There we go. So this this uh, is set up like this, in that we've got the uh, actions uh, layer, animation stops there, until we press play elsewhere, and then it animates for a moment, loops back to the beginning, and it's, it stops at that point where it's broken. Actually, we do. We need one more stop here. F7 stop. Okay, so th this is a little bit different than the um, than the than the gate opening. The gate um, opens up. Once it's open, then we go. This is more complicated in that we have hit detection. So the window it's doing its own thing in that it. Um, it plays, that it animates, it breaks, and then it stops at that point. But elsewhere in the code is the code then to go to the next place. Okay, wait, sorry, looking at my code one more time because it gets a little jumbled. No, not a stop. Uh, it does have the, um, it does have the go to that scene. Okay, yeah, so after the rock touches the glass, it plays the frames to break. After we see it break, uh, then we have the go to the next scene. So, movie clip. So a stop at the beginning, yes, so that the glass doesn't break by itself. But on frame 24, this is where we've got the go to the other scene. This, this is the correct one right here. So uh, just to break it down again, this is inside of the symbol and inside of window right symbol. And frame one of action, stop, so that the glass doesn't break by itself. F7 for a blank keyframe on frame 24. After the animation happens, frame 24, go to and play frame one, scene hall. After it, after it goes through those frames, things break, then it goes to scene hall.
in order for this ever to happen, in order for the glass to break and to go to the next place. Okay, now let's set ourselves up to be able to pick up that rock and move it. We've written code to tap something and something happens. But now we need to pick up something and move it elsewhere. We tap it, we move it over here, it breaks the window, and then it moves there. So I'm going to go back to the, the main scene here. Actions, actions layer on the door, on the door scene. This is the code we have there so far. When you tap the door, it wiggles. So after that, we'll set up code. We'll see. Event listeners to detect, drag, and drop. All right, we have event listeners so far for tapping one time. But now we're going to need to have listeners to listen for the moment that you drag it. And if you're dragging, eventually you let it go, drag and drop. So we need to have listeners to drag and drop. The name of the rock, rock underscore MC dot add event listener just let me confirm I called mine rock right this thing here rock MC yep okay so the name of your object dot add event listener we're gonna need two of them because first we're going to detect the event of tapping it and dragging it. And then we're going to need to detect the moment we let it go. So drag and drop. That's two events. The event of dragging it, the event of letting it go. Touch event dot touch begin. versus touch event dot touch end so now we've got pay attention to when we begin to touch and drag the object and then pay attention to when we end, when we stop dragging the object. Both of these are going to run two different functions. We'll have fn rock move and fn rock stop. What happens as we're moving the rock around? What happens when we stop moving the rock? Functions defining the drag of the rock and the stopping of the rock. So up above, so far what we've done is we've defined the event listener and then right next to it, we've defined its function. This is, we've defined the event listeners and then the functions. Writing it this way is exactly the same as writing it above. Uh, I'll explain that further in one moment, but I'm going to then say, okay, well, this function, fn rock move, function fn rock stop
This is the same as before. I wrote them in a slightly different order, and it doesn't matter. We've written it event listener, and then right away the function definition. We, put, we grouped two of the event listeners together, and then grouped two of the functions together. That would be exactly the same. You don't have to change this, but it would be exactly the same if instead I put this one right here, and then this one right here. So I'll undo it in a moment. You don't have to do this. But this is exactly the same right here as we've done before. Event listener, function definition. Event listener, function definition. Yes. Yeah, that's exactly the same as. That's exactly the same as uh, what I wrote right here. That they're both in one spot, and then the functions are next. That's exactly the same. So I'm going to end function rock move and function rock stop. And then before we forget, inside of each of these parentheses, it's the same thing as usual, event, touch event. Same as before. Um, there's some sort of event. This one is just a tap. Tap it, let it go, do something. Event, touch event. These ones are slightly different. When we begin dragging it, when we end dragging it. But they still are related to touch events. So inside these parentheses, again, as usual, event, colon, touch events. So up here we're saying, we're going to pay attention to when this thing moves, and what happens when this thing moves. Well, we also need to define parameters. I want to be able to move this object around within my, within my game, within the screen of the device. So we have to set the, the boundaries of where can we move the thing. I want to be able to move this anywhere in my game. But you could set it up that you could move a thing only within a small area of your game. Let's say you've made it so that you have a puzzle that you have to move some levers or move some blocks around, not all over the screen, but within a little small area. So when we write the code in a moment, we will, we will see that this is how we can define where this object can be moved around to. And we'll set this up. Uh, let's set it up. Um, let's set it up before this, actually. Before those event listeners, let's back up a little bit and say define the boundaries where the rock can move. So we know we're going, we're, we're setting this up, we're setting ourselves up here to move the thing. But we should say, from where to where? Where is it valid for us to move the thing? So var rock boundaries. There's a variable, a container. We haven't dealt with variables yet in this game. We dealt with variables in the previous game. What were a couple of the variables we used in the previous game to keep track of? Anyone remember? What were we using them there? The points. In the tap game, we were keeping track of points or the time. Those were variables to keep track of. Right here, here's a variable to keep track of the boundaries of where the rock can be moved. Actually, one thing here, colon, rectangle. Previously, when we made the timer, 
for the or the or the points we had a variable with whatever name colon number it was a variable it was an object keeping track of numbers now I've got here there are going to be some boundaries and it's going to be a rectangle because these things these devices are rectangles I want a shape of a rectangle where I can move around on the screen I could if I want to get advanced make one as a circle so you can only move your object in a circular area it's a little more advanced that I want to do at the moment but I want to set it up that I can move my rock all over the rectangle of my screen so with when we say equals we're defining what are the what are the what are those coordinates so we'll say new space rectangle parentheses we're going to define a fence or a boundary we're going to define a rectangle and that rectangle is going to appear right here so it says um, we need a number, comma, another number, x and y, comma, a width, comma, a height. So to define this rectangle, we need to say, where does it start? Most likely at the very top left of the screen, 0, comma, 0, comma. So we're saying, let's make the area where the rock can move, starting from the top left corner, 0, 0 is the top left corner, so right here, this is 0, 0. If I have x equals 20, it moves 20 spaces over. If I have x is equal to 100, it moves 100 spaces over. And then y, x and y, so y is 0 here. 0, x is equal to 10, it moves 10 units down. X is equal to two, or y is equal to 200, it moves 200 units down. So we're saying start at, at the top left corner of the game, 0, 0. Then if we wanted to say, for example, like I said, 250, comma, 400, we've defined there the the height, how big this box is. This box, starting from the top right corner, will be 200 units wide and then 400 units tall. So I'm sort of defining I can only move the rock on this half of the screen, which I don't want. I want to be able to move it anywhere. So we can, instead of setting these values, instead of setting those values, maybe 200 works on this tablet. What if I have a smaller phone or a larger phone? 200 might be out of bounds. So we have a way instead for it to know exactly stage dot stage width. So start at the top left corner and make it as wide the width, make it as wide as the the the, the, the width of the stage. This project that I've made is uh, is eight hundred by 480. But when it goes on different sized devices, it automatically stretches smaller or bigger. So width is automatically set. And if I have stage width, I also have stage dot stage height. Okay, so all of that is to set ourselves up to be able to move around the, the rock within anywhere on the screen. Again, if you want to get fancy and only allow this object to be moved in a certain area, you have to figure out the x and y coordinates, starting point, and how much space, width, and height to give it.
that this is anywhere in the in the scene. Jumping back down to rock move, we have event dot target dot start touch drag so the moment that I, that I touch the rock and I have not let it go yet I'm moving the rock this kicks it and all of this is just to say um, the currently the thing that I currently tapped on so the current thing that I've tapped on let's start to move it around Event dot touch point ID, comma false, comma rock boundaries. So uh, I want to touch the rock. I will begin, I will hold it down, run this function. Okay, you've touched something, some target, you've touched the rock. Let's let us drag it. Uh, I forget exactly what touch point ID does, comma, center registration, don't worry. Within the boundaries, let me move this rock within the boundaries. The boundaries were set from the top left of the screen to the very edges of the screen. So let me move the rock throughout the screen. When I let my mouse, when I let my finger go, when I move the object around, I have touch end. Okay, now let's pay attention to you let it go. Where did you let it go? Is it touching the rock? And so inside of function rock stop, we have event dot target dot Stop touch drag. Event dot touch point ID. And be careful here, this ID is capital I and capital D. Looks very similar to the one above. The one above, however, says start touch drag within the boundaries. And this one says stop touch drag with nothing else. So I'm going to pick up the object, I'm going to pick up the rock, move it around, I'm going to drop it on the glass, on the window. This function will kick in, it'll stop dragging it around. But then we need a conditional statement, we need to check. If the rock is touching the window, play the animation of the window breaking, and then move to the next scene. Or else, if that rock is instead touching the door, do nothing. I, I'm only testing that the rock touches the window on the right so that you can go to the next scene. If the rock touches anything else, nothing happens. So the condition is if something curly braces or else something else Rock did touch the window right. Rock did not touch 
window right. So this if else condition we had previously, if we've hit the boss 10 times, if hit points is greater than 10, true, it's dead, do something. Or else, if we didn't tap it enough, not dead yet, nothing happens. Here in this case, we're doing slightly something different, but it's still going to be true or false. If this happens, it's true. If it didn't happen, it's false. The true part is the first section. The else part is the false section. And what we're trying to check now is uh, rock underscore mc dot hit test object parentheses. We are going to check the state of the rock. We, we let go of the rock. I'm going to run this command here. Let's test. Was there a hit? Did this object hit this object? This object in parentheses. Did this object hit this object? In the parentheses, we type the name of the window, the window object, which is the instance name, which is, what is that again? It's window mc write mc. In the parentheses, We're, we're trying to confirm, did any part of this object hit this other object? So this has an instance name on the screen. That's the actual rock. The window has an instance name. So rockmc.hitTestObject. Let's test that this object hit this object. If it did, then we will play the animation of the window breaking which also has the part that says go to the next scene. If instead, once we let go of the rock and we let it go on the door, it'll say, it'll look for, did the rock touch the door? No, the rock is currently touching, I mean, did the rock touch the window? No, it's touching the door. So the else part happens, which is nothing. It didn't touch, just nothing happened. We dropped the rock. So here we've got window right and see play play the animation of the of the window breaking and once you get past once it gets past the part of it breaking it has the play it has the movie clip go to and play scene hall so scene hall inside of that symbol go to scene hall I think at this point we can save it and run it. We can test it. Uh, I'll end the lecture in a moment, but I just want to confirm this part works. I want to check that mine works. It was a lot of typing, yes, but the logic of it, hopefully it makes a little bit of sense. All of this is the new code we wrote after the break, listening for the moment that we move the rock, listening for the moment we stop moving the rock, setting up our boundaries, how far can we move the rock, and then, well, when we stop moving the rock, let's check. Did the rock touch this object? Yes. OK, play the animation, move us to the next place. If it didn't touch, do nothing. The else doesn't do anything except a little comment. We don't need it to do anything. The rock touching the door does nothing. If I want to get fancy, 
I could program it so that when the rock touches the other window, something else happens. But um, at the very least here, let me check this one. Let's check, let me check my code. I'll put the code back in a moment, and then we'll do help in a moment, but it's just let me check mine. And that gets in the way while it's while it's publishing, sorry, so it cuts off a little bit, but I'll put it back in a moment. I didn't, at least I didn't get any errors when I published it, so that's good. I'll close this right here. Back at the welcome, I press play on that. I'm at the gate. Press to open the gate. Great. Just for fun, I know it works, but if I tap the door, it still does nothing. Good. Now I'm going to tap and move the rock. Ooh, the rock moves. And it moves anywhere I want on the screen because I have the boundaries set to I can move it anywhere I want. Obviously, putting there does nothing. Putting there does nothing. Putting there does nothing. Putting there breaks, moves on to the hallway. So that was that hit detection happening right there. And here, nothing happens here. Of course, I haven't programmed anything here. But that's how that was. Um, that was that last code right there. All of that code there was set up to allow me to move the rock to then test when one object touches another. There was a hit detection. You saw I dropped it on the other window. Nothing happened. I dropped it on the door. Nothing happened. But when I dropped the rock on the window right, it went to true. It played the animation. And then it went to the next scene. Yes, I make it look so easy, but it'll be easy for you too once you get some practice. And all you need is about 15 years and you'll be okay. That's it? That's it, yeah. So I'm going to save this. I'm going to put this into the network folder in case you want to compare my code with your code. Remember, when I put my code into the folder, copy the code, don't edit the original file because you're editing for everyone else. Be careful. If you want to look at my code, copy it to your flash drive. Um, uh, I'm going to upload the video also in case you want to replay it. Uh, you want to make sure this works before you leave. Over the weekend, you want to start editing some of this stuff. When we come back, we'll keep doing the code. But now we're in the hallway. We're going to go left hallway, right hallway, and so forth. We're going to have a few ways to die. We haven't died yet. Um, and we'll go on. So let me just set myself up right here, and I'll, and I'll help you in just a moment.